I am Hayden Cadel, a member of the Order of the Nephilim, and the embodiment of its values, at least that's what I believe. The echoing corridors of time have borne witness to the illustrious lineage of the Cadel family, a legacy I bear with immense pride. Anchored in the heart of the island of neutrals, my family's name has reverberated through the ages, a testament to our steadfastness. My father, Minos Cadel, a man of unwavering integrity, holds a position of reverence and responsibility within the Council of Navrio. Each decision, every utterance of his, is steeped in the welfare of our people. But the heart of our home was always my mother. A former beacon of the Order herself, she relinquished her roles to cradle both me and my spirited sister, Lyra, guiding us through the labyrinth of life. With my comrades, young boys of brazen spirit, we adventure to these shores, our sanctuary. The vastness of the sea before us, we would dive into its embrace and emerge as warriors from tales long past. Youthful exuberance painted our every action, every challenge a game, every game a battle. On that destined day, a playful squabble arose between Ickle, my brother in arms, and me. It was but a trifle, a mere possession that drew a line between us. But as his fist struck true, it wasn't just the sting of betrayal or the heat of anger I felt. The very earth seemed to sense my turmoil. Pebbles, those silent witnesses, defied the very essence of their being, lifting, swirling, dancing around me in an ethereal ballet. They mirrored the chaos within me, an orchestra of elements playing a symphony of emotions. The moment my nascent powers erupted, the world as I knew it irrevocably shifted. To safeguard my destiny and perhaps their own hearts from the unpredictable tempest I had become, my parents made the grave decision to deliver me into the venerable hands of Erowyn, the illustrious high archon of our revered order. It wasn't long before the austere corridors of the academy whispered to me, their stone-cold embrace a stark contrast to the warm bosom of my family's abode. The omnipresent archon Zephyr took me under his vast wingspan. He didn't just teach, he guided, nurtured, and when necessary, chastised. More than an archon, more than a master, he filled the void of fatherhood that distance had created. The discipline of the academy was relentless. Telekinesis was no longer a mere child's outburst, it was an art, a skill to be honed. My sword, an extension of my soul, danced with grace and fury in equal measure. But the true alchemy was in the conjuring of Ethereus or the shimmering substance materialized from thin air at my beckoning, and soon, my fingers, adept and skilled, molded it into armaments of beauty and might. Amidst the rigorous toil and turmoil, Gia appeared, a welcome reprieve. She was the verdant spring amidst my winter, the very pulse of life. Our spirits aligned, and before we knew it, mischief and adventures became our daily ritual. The citadel, with all its grandeur, became our playground. Konos, with his prideful stride, crossed our path next. At first, he was the storm cloud on our sunny horizon. His skepticism over my bond with Gia was palpable, his disdain unmasked. But as sands shifted in the hourglass, so did his perceptions. The fierce rival transformed into an unwavering ally, adding his strength to our inseparable duo. By the whims of fate, the burgeoning powers within my spirited sister, Lyra, awaken in an inferno of chaos. A dwelling, consumed in a blaze of her unintended making, crumbled to ashes before her very eyes. It was a melancholic tale of her first tryst with power, yet by some divine grace, the flames spared every soul within. In our realm, the Nephilim, who bore the gift or perhaps the curse of fire and other such volatile elements, found themselves bound by an unwritten decree. They were beckoned to our order, not as punishment but as salvation, for within our hallowed walls lay the means to tame such unbridled forces. Those fortunate enough to bear gifts less destructive were presented a choice, to embrace the order's mantle or to carve their own path. Lyre, with her spirit as wild as a storm and her heart as tender as a midsummer's embrace, cast her lot with me. Ever my shadow, her fiery essence breathed new life into our ensemble. What once was a trio became a formidable quartet, bound not just by blood and bond, but by shared destiny. As days melded into nights, and seasons changed their guard, Archon and Sefer's teachings became the very marrow of our being. With each sunrise, my prowess, and that of my companions, found new depths, new horizons. 
but it wasn't all rigorous training and solemn lessons. In moments of reprieve, the Archon would regale us with tales from the annals of his youth. Adventures filled with valor, sacrifice, and lessons hard-earned. We, the eager apprentices, hung onto his every word, each tale a beacon, a standard. We aspired, dreamt, and hoped that perhaps, in the annals of time, we too might etch legacies half as grand as the illustrious Archon Sefer. As the relentless wheel of time bore on, the Academy's stone halls echoed with the evidence of my progress. Archon Zephyr's wisdom cut and polished my raw talents as a lapidary would a gem, until I, in my 18th year, stood at the cusp of mastery. It was then, amid the golden glow of my final Academy season, that Zephyr deemed me ready to step beyond the threshold of study into the crucible of reality. He summoned me, his voice imbued with the gravity of impending tumult to partake in an undertaking that would chart the course of my destiny. We were to set sail for the Isles of Lyrendel, gems of the south, now clouded by a burgeoning shadow. The Isles had become the haunt of the dread Vortorum Umbrum, creatures both of the deep and of our darkest fables. No simple beasts were these, but cunning predators who wore human skin as one might a cloak, their guises as perfect as the calm that precedes the storm. They infiltrated the unsuspecting Isles, their presence an unseen plague. Their atrocities were whispered in hushed tones by the hearth fires, a litany of horror that chilled the marrow. With each tale, each recounted witness, the reality of their threat grew more palpable and more immediate. These Vortorum Umbrarum, they fed not just for sustenance, but for sport, their hunger for human flesh a vile thread woven into the very fabric of their being. As the day of departure dawned, I gazed upon the gilded horizon, knowing full well the trials that awaited. The weight of potential loss, the promise of battle, hung heavy in the air, as tangible as the morning mist that clung to the Academy's ancient stones. But with the weight came a fire, an eagerness to test my mettle, to bring to bear all that Zephyr had instilled within me. And so, with a heart tempered by resolve and a blade sharpened by purpose, I embarked upon the path that would lead through perilous waters, into legend or into oblivion. The ship's timbers groaned as we, Zephyr's chosen, stepped upon the rain-drenched docks of Vailnorin. There was Archon Zephyr, whose presence alone commanded the air of something ancient and indomitable, Lysara, with eyes that hinted at a depth of wisdom, unfathomable and serene, Corin, whose stern visage masked a resolve as unyielding as the iron at his hip, and myself, Hayden, the novice of our cotter, whose thoughts could stir the world without a whisper. Vailnorin, a jewel of commerce nestled between the arms of a slumbering sea, was a tapestry of human endeavor. Here, where the scent of brine mingled with the aromas of myriad spices, the people lived a dance of daily trade and nocturnal repose. Yet now, the dance had faltered, stumbling in the dark as an unseen predator, the Vortorum Umbrarum, devoured life and left silence in its wake. Homes once abuzz with the warmth of kinship now stood as hollow echoes of dread, their hearts cool, their laughter extinguished. Gavril, the town's custodio, greeted us with a mix of reverence and stark trepidation. His was the task of safeguarding Vailnorin's populace, a task that had become a waking nightmare. He led us to quarters that promised rest, but stood as mere shadows against the looming threat. Days unraveled with the patience of a silent hunt. Our inquiries, thorough and unending, bore no fruit, the specter of fear grew with each sun's setting. While my companions wove their subtleties into the fabric of our search, my own thoughts reached out, unseen tendrils questing for the pulse of our court. But the Vortorum Umbrarum were as whispers on the wind, leaving nary a trace, but for the sorrow of their passing three more souls spirited away into the shroud of the night. The people of Vailnorin watched us with eyes that flickered with the last embers of hope, their gazes heavy with unspoken pleas. They sought salvation from the maw of darkness that had besieged them, and we, in our silent oath, had promised it. It was on the crest of twilight when our search bore its grim fruit. Lysara and I stumbled upon a scene of fresh horror, the Vortorum Umbrarum, its guise slipping, stood over its latest cord. Alas, we were but seconds too late. The woman's life had been cruelly snuffed out, her body yet warm as the creature feasted. Lysara acted with the ferocity of the tempest seas, her command over water unfurling in a torrent that struck the creature with the wrath of the tides. And I, Hayden, reached out with my mind's grasp, 
ensnaring the beast in an invisible vise. It thrashed a maelstrom of desperation, its form flickering between the human mask it wore and the abomination it truly was. The air itself seemed to shudder with its struggle, the boundaries of its shape blurring and twisting in a grotesque dance. As the creature's true visage broke through, a vile countenance of hunger and malice, I felt a strain against my hold. I turned to Lysara, my voice edged with urgency. I cannot hold it forever. I confess. She, with eyes as steely as the blade she wielded, gave a nod that was all the response needed. With a swift, fluid motion, like the river cutting through the earth, her sword sang through the air, parting flesh from sinew. The creature's hull tore through the silence of the evening, a sound that seemed to claw at the very soul. Its legs, the instruments of its predation, fell away, leaving it writhing, a serpent disarmed. Lysara's gaze met mine, her visage stone. Young neophyte, she began, her voice a steel whisper, there is no place for hesitation's gentle hand in the face of such darkness. Be as the winter's frost, as the mountains fall roofless when the time calls for it. Her words were a lesson etched in the air, hanging between us like a decree. She commanded me to watch the creature, to hold it in my telekinetic grip, as she sought Zephyr. The Archon's wisdom would be needed to pry open the secrets that this Fortorum Umbrarum held within its twisted mind. And so, I stood sentinel over the defeated monster, my thoughts a whirlpool of what had transpired, and Lysara's counsel a new weight upon my shoulders. The chamber's air was taut with the weight of impending decision as Zephyr pronounced our departure on the morrow. Intent on securing passage, he offered no instruction on the fate of our captive leaving with the corn in his way. Their departure was a gust, leaving ripples across the still waters of our resolve. It was then, in the dimming echoes of their footsteps, that I sought counsel, voicing the question that gnawed at my conscience. Yet Zephyr's departing glance had sealed the creature's fate, a silent pact entrusted to Lysara's interpretation. Lysara, her voice, the edge of steel, declared a sentence. My protest, a feeble plea for this order's mercy, was a whisper against the gale of her resolve. She spun a vision of my future, one where leadership would demand the will to embrace necessity's cruel embrace. The creature, its purpose serve, was a loose thread in the tapestry of our mission, its continued existence a liability we could ill afford. Yet there I stood, a fledgling among eagles, trembling at the precipice of a grim right. Lysara's whisper was a dagger's blade at my back urging, goading. With hands unseen, my powers reached forth encircling the creature's spectral neck. The act was a betrayal of my own innocence, a shattering of an unspoken vow never to yield to the seductive call of power's darker urges. And as the creature's form slackened, the finality of its stillness mirrored the quiet death of a part of my own spirit. In the solemn silence that followed, Lysara and I stood as custodians of a necessary darkness, the burden of our deeds a shadow upon our souls. Dawn's light had scarcely kissed the horizon when Zephyr's call gathered us. We converged at a quaint port, its name a song of two cultures, Elvendario, where the melodies of ancient elvish lineage wove seamlessly with the vibrant chords of a sun-kissed tongue. There, Zephyr had brokered passage with a crew of treasure seekers, the glint of gold coins a language understood by all. To sweeten the deal, he vowed that any riches beyond our quarry would be theirs to claim. As the sails unfurled, capturing the breath of a new day, I questioned the wisdom of our mundane approach. Why forsake the long-distance portal for this slow voyage? The Archon, gaze fixed upon the horizon, spoke of remote energies and destinations beyond the reach of even our most potent arcana. His words, though veiled in assurance, carried an undercurrent of concern that I could not quite place. Aboard the ship, amidst the thrum of life and the creaking wood, I found myself in the company of an old mariner, his face a map of the sea's caprices. He spun tales as one would spin yarn from wool's stories of the deep, of creatures both wondrous and dreadful. Of the Vortorum Umbrarum, he whispered a tale most chilling. Once, he claimed, they were but men and women, a tribe who earned the ire of a coven of witches. For their trespasses, they were ensnared in a curse most vile, their humanity stripped away leaving only hunger and the abyssal depth in their way. The old sailor's eyes, 
clouded by the mist of fear and avarice, revealed his innermost turmoil. The promise of untold treasures on that accursed isle was a siren's call he could scarcely resist yet it was the same call that he feared might herald his doom. As I listened, the ship's timbers groaning like the bones of the earth, I could not help but wonder whether the tales we tell are but reflections of our own truths, cast upon the canvas of the world's mysteries. The isles loomed upon the horizon, shrouded in the mist of foreboding, as the captain, with his spyglass pressed to weathered eye, discerned the malignant sprawl of a Vortorum Umbrarum settlement. It was a blight upon the pristine wild, a darkness that crept across the land like a funeral shroud. Zephyr, with the weight of command resting upon his shoulders, beseeched Lysara to marshal her dominion over the sea. She obliged, her focus drawing forth the waters to grant us passage, bending the ocean's wrath to her will, easing our approach to the cursed shore. The captain, a man who knew the precarious dance between greed and survival, heeded Zephyr's counsel to hold back, his vessel a silent sentinel amidst the waves. And so, with the ship at anchor, we disembarked onto the shifting sands of fate. Zephyr unveiled his strategy, a litany of maneuvers, and intense, but it was Lysara's voice that cleaved the air with a truth most stark. We must purge this taint, she declared, a sentinel facing the darkness. Her resolve was a beacon as we contemplated the grim task of excision. Zephyr's nod was a man conceding to necessity, though his heart lay heavy with the cost of such deeds. Our advance was measured, a predator stalked through the bracken and bone-strewn sands. Yet some among us were lured by the siren call of avarice. The treasure seekers, eyes alight with a gleam of gold, strayed from our purpose, their greed drawing them to a macabre harvest. It was a fatal misstep. The Voratorum, with the silence of the grave, sprung their deadly trap. Claws, like knives of the deepest ocean, reaped the lives of those men with the swiftness of death's own sight. The chaos of ambush was a clarion call to battle. Zephyr's command to engage was almost unnecessary, as the instinct to fight, to survive, surged within us all. I reached into the Earth's embrace, hefting aloft two mighty boulders with the force of my will, and sent them hurtling towards our foes. Lysara, a tempest incarnate, advanced with blades flashing, a dance of death played out upon the blood-soaked shores. In the fray of battle, the virtues of daylight vision availed corn not under the glaring sun, yet his prowess lay undiminished. Each stroke of his blade was a verse in the epic of war, sung with the precision of a maestro's baton. We stood, a fellowship bound by blood yet to be spilled, upon the sands that would bear witness to our valor or our demise. The Voratorum, in their multitudes, surged forth like a tide of malice, their numbers a sea that threatened to drown us in. Darkness. They were six to our one, a relentless wave crashing upon the bulwark of our resolve. Yet we stood, as the ancient cliffs against the storm, unyielding. Lysara, with the grace of the gale, moved through our foes, her twin blades a blur of silver death. Zephyr, the manipulator, wielded his powers with the subtlety of the weaving spider. Ensnaring the minds of our adversaries, turning their certainty into disarray. And I, Hayden, found within myself a well of power heretofore untapped. My hands, outstretched, became the conduits of ruin, hurling the very stones of the beach like giant's missiles against our foe. The air was thick with the salt of the sea and the iron of blood, the symphony of battle crescendoing to a fever pitch around us. The treasure seekers, those men of fortune, became warriors on that shore, their eyes alight with the fire of survival. Each man fought not for the gleam of gold, but for the breath of life, their greed-fueled courage a surprising ally in our desperate stand. Yet as each Vortorum fell, another seemed to rise, as inexorable as the dusk. Our blades swung, our wills clashed against the overwhelming dark. It was a dance with death, a fight not for glory, but for the morrow a morrow that seemed but a fragile dream beneath the onslaught of night made flesh. The sun, its relentless arc, bore witness to the full measure of our struggle, casting long shadows as the hours waned. As evening bled into night, and back again to dawn, we cleaved through the horde of Vortorum, leaving the once cursed sands cleansed by the sanctity of our resolve. Lysara, steadfast in the storm, bore the mark of our battle a wound etched by the claws of malice near the tender expanse of her neck. Though the cut was shallow, the threat of some venomous taint lingered in our minds like the remnants of a nightmare. 
The treasure seekers, those men of high seas and higher hopes, paid dearly for their lust of gold. Their numbers were have brothers in arms lost to the savage caress of the Vortorum. Yet, even as they mourned, the gleam of avarice flickered in their eyes, for the spoils of the island promised a wealth that would echo through their lifetimes. We stood by our word, weary sentinels to the laden rites of fortune. Together we consigned the fallen to flame, their pyres a beacon of solemn victory. The Vorotorum, too, were given to the fire, their twisted forms rendered to ash that the wind might forget their foulness. I recall the exhaustion, a mantle heavy upon my shoulders, as the last of the wretched creatures fell by my hand. My powers, once a torrent, now ebbed to but a trickle, my limbs leaden as if I too bore the weight of the treasure that lay heaped upon the shore. The black smoke ascended like dark wraiths into the sky, a stark contrast to the clarity of the day. It clawed its way heavenward, a signal of the end of the creatures that once claimed the island as their haunt. In that billowing darkness, the silence of our number spoke volumes, words were needless when the heart was full of tumult.